Hey guys, Mike here again. Uh, we just had a really nasty day in the stock market. Um, I think the NASDAQ closed 5% down and the S&P was down a lot as well, close to 4%, I think. Um, and I just thought I'd do a market update to uh, talk about what my strategy is here. Um, we've had some really big days over the last couple of weeks. I mean, three, four, five percent. This is totally crazy. Um, so I think the market currently is deciding whether it is in a consolidation pattern, ready for another leg up. And let's see if the bu the buyers overwhelm the sellers and we've put in a bottom here or the market's deciding whether it is going to turn into a full-fledged bear market um, and possibly a crash depending on the speed of it but um, so I'm going to do three parts in this video I'll look at the chart um, first the S&P chart and then I'll talk about the uh, confluence of negative factors that are all coming together all at the same time here so uh, there's a lot of warning signals going on right now uh, and there is a lot of fear that goes along with that if people aren't oblivious to this so we'll have to check out whether we think this is a um, a, a fear-based bottom or if this is a sign of things to come uh, and then the last part, I'll talk about what my strategy is here in terms of my cash holdings and the holdings within my portfolio. Um, so feel free to skip forward and look at that if you're not interested in maybe looking at the chart. Um, so charts typically are like, uh, talking about charts are kind of like blasphemy, uh, witchcraft, I don't know, tarot card readings, stuff like that. In the value investing community, basically they're, uh, charts are really not paid attention to. Um, however, I do look at charts. Uh, I've been in the market quite a while and my view on charts now is I don't use them to uh, as the sole basis of a trade or a purchase. I still do that based on fundamentals. Um, but I have noticed over the years that there are certain patterns that um, repeat uh, and the reason I think that they do that is my view on charts are it's they're not anything in and of themselves, but my view on them is that they are essentially the visual representation of market psychology, right? So, you, and that's why the patterns repeat because human nature repeats in the market. You know, the, we have the same kinds of patterns that we had a hundred years ago in the stock market. Um, because people are the same. They react uh, with fear and greed and then turning points uh, in similar ways because uh, the human mi mind is just wired um, in certain ways. So if I'm looking at the S&P chart here, I really think there's a key level that we're at right now around, uh, you know, 4,100, 4,150, maybe 4,000. And um, <clears throat> one of the other one of the other things about charting is that there's a lot of people who really believe in it and use it as the basis of movement, um, of trading. Um, and there are also a lot of algorithms that are built on this kind of stuff too. So uh, charting can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you can see things that other people are looking at, other people are saying, oh, um, well, these people think this is going to happen, so I should get on the boat. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so I kind of see one of these situations uh, happening here at the current market level for the S&P. Um, the market looks like it's really trying to hold this level at 4150 kind of thing. And if it does and the buyers win this, we could be looking at a move up towards the uh, upper purple line there, which is the, uh, the top of the trend line. And if it breaks that, we could be in for a move upwards. Now, if it breaks down below 4,150 or even 4,000, because that's a psychological level, we could see uh, <clears throat> possibly the meat of a bear market take hold here. Uh, the second wave in a bear market is usually the, the, the deepest and also the most protracted. So if this is in fact a bear market, um, we could see a big move over a long period of time as people get discouraged and just uh, give up and sell. Uh, I've been through two bear markets before and it is uh, not as easy to hold through a bear market as 
it seems like it is when you look backwards at the uh, the history of it. Um, when you're in the middle of it, it's quite it, it's quite painful for almost everyone, um, and the long term mentality goes out the window for a lot of people. So just just a warning there. I don't actually know which way this is going to go. I'm not making a prediction, but I I need to look at all the different options that could happen and look at what the market's telling me. And that's sort of what it's telling me right now. Okay, so for the negative factors that are uh, around right now, um, I think this is an extremely dangerous market um, in terms of the way it's valued and the, and the number of things that are going on. Um, so negative things that are going on right now, one is, you know, the market moves with the Fed. The Fed and the, and the U.S. government basically move markets. And right now, the Fed is doing exactly the opposite of what they were doing through 2020 and early 2021, or even most of 2021, where they were injecting liquidity. They had low interest, super low interest rates to try and spur the economy on. And it worked. We had this huge rally to ridiculous levels that wasn't really supported by earnings. Um, so it was a Fed engineered uh, bull market, in my opinion. Um, and now they're going the other way. So we have tightening interest rates. Higher interest rates are bad for almost every asset class. Um, as Buffett says, they're like gravity. So house for house prices, bond market, stock market, as interest rates go up, people need bigger returns on those assets. So the prices go down. Um, that doesn't happen exactly in time, but if they keep raising them, that will be one of the effects of it. Um, and they're also reducing their balance sheet by 95 billion a month, month which is a lot. Um, so they're pulling liquidity out of the market actively now as they just change directions. Um, another negative thing that we all know about is inflation. Uh, inflation is running rampant right now. I believe it's actually higher than the official figures. Um, and you know, it hurts businesses, it hurts consumers. And back to the Fed, the Fed has the inflation blinders on. They, they don't care about anything except inflation right now. And that's their whole job is to fight inflation. And the way they do that is by slowing the economy down. Um, that's, that's the system they use. Um, so with central banks and primarily the Fed, what they tend to do is they tend to be reactive. So they'll go in one direction and try and solve a problem but they always go too far in that direction and create a different problem. Um, and then when they, when that problem becomes too big, they change direction to solve that problem and they end up creating a different problem. So my view on it is that they are gonna keep fighting inflation until a few things, one of a few things happens. One, uh, one is they break something. So last time they tried to tighten uh, the stock market fell by 20% and then they freaked out and had to change directions. So we could have a situation where they break something like the stock market and we get a big downdraft and then they have to reconsider where they're at. Um, the other thing that could happen is inflation could just go away by itself. Um, and that's a possibility, you know, like sometimes inflation just fix it, can fix itself, cause or cure for higher prices is higher prices. Um, but I don't think one of the options here is the Fed wins versus inflation, because usually they have to get to a uh, inflation or sorry, an interest rate that's higher than inflation. So if they're trying to beat 8.4% official rate, they've got to get interest rates to nine or 10%, which would cause a massive recession. And they're going too slowly. They'll never get there. Something's going to break before then. Um, now, the problem is it's almost designed in order to fail because when they raise rates, what happens is they, if the stock market and nothing breaks, they go, oh, that's a green light to do more. So they do more. If nothing breaks, they do more. And they just keep doing that until there, there is some, some problem that they can't not pay attention to. Um, okay. So then a few, few other, uh, problems here. We have U.S. government spending gridlock. They spent $3 trillion. Uh, they're at a $3, $3 trillion deficit in 2021. That went into, a lot of that went into people's pockets and it was uh, spent over time. Uh, that spending is not there anymore. Uh, the, and the 
Democrats look like they might uh, lose um, either the House or the Senate, which would basically put the government spending on ice for the next two years after that. So we don't have the, like the Fed, we don't have the government put in place either right now. Um, and that's similar for most countries. I'm in Canada. My, my government loves de deficit spending, so we don't have, <laughs> we haven't cut back as much as the U.S. has, but uh, still we, we've cut back from 2020. Um, a big problem here is for me is actually the Schiller P.E. ratio of the market. So we're at almost an all-time high, second highest ever at 33, um, which is means the business yield for the whole market is 3%. And now you have bond yields that are above 3%. And so that makes stocks not look attractive at those levels. So the stock market does have to come down in order to look attractive um, to bonds. The historical ratio there is that uh, bond rates are below the business yield rate in the stock market. Um, so I think that could be, we could have a uh, bubble deflation here from, from a PE perspective in the market. Um, on, on top of that, <laughs> we have first quarter earnings, which aren't actually looking good in a lot of companies. Um, growth rates have slowed down or even gone negative in some of the, some of the bigger, more in, important companies in the market. Um, so when you have slowing growth and an almost an all time high PE ratio, that is a dangerous combination. Um, okay, so there's that. And then the last one is, uh, everyone's probably seen, but the US economy slowed by 1.4% in the first quarter. So that puts us in a potential recession situation if uh, the next quarter is negative as well. Um, and even if it's not a recession, everyone that I meet is spending less or their businesses are having trouble compared to what they were doing last year. In fact, my private company that I own is definitely feeling it this year. We are noticing the, uh, the hangover effects from the, all the COVID stuff. Okay, so now that I'm done scaring everybody, I, I guess, you know, what's the question, uh, our, what's the question here that we want to do uh, with our portfolio, right? So uh, the way I deal with this stuff is I personally run through multiple scenarios, right? So let's say it's a consolidation pattern and the market goes up by 50%. I look at my portfolio and kind of estimate how stuff would do in that environment. And then I say, okay, how do I feel about that, right? Um, personally, I, own, I have 22% cash right now, and if the market goes up, I'm going to miss out on some of that, right? Because I've got that cash, right? And then I run it through another scenario. Let's say it goes up a little bit, 10, 20%. How do I feel about my portfolio in that scenario? And then more importantly, I do this on the downside, right? So what happens if the market comes down by 20% and my portfolio is down by, let's say, 30%? Because um, I expect that my portfolio might come down faster than uh, than uh, the actual market. Maybe that's wrong, uh, but I'll just guess it at 30% down. And then I run through a 50% down situation and I say, okay, how do I feel about that? Right. So I put myself in those positions and say, okay, what is the worst situation for me? And for me, I found out that the worst situation was having a market that has been obliterated and stocks are really cheap and not having any cash to buy. For me, that's the that's way worse than the market going up and me missing out on, you know, twenty percent of the upside because I'm in cash, right? So I'm 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 I position myself for the negative scenario, and I'm happy to forego some upside if I'm if the market does continue higher somehow to a forty p or whatever. <laughs> if I don't know if it can get there, but if it does, like. Um, you know, I'll, I'll leave some money on the table and I'm okay with that. Um, one other strategy that I have, which is not really related to how the market's going, but I generally buy low PE or price to cash flow stocks. So I think my, my overall portfolio is about 8.3. Uh, so that I think gives me a bit of a margin of safety. Uh, like if I'm holding a stock that's at 40 PE and the market comes down by 30%, that stock's probably down 60, 70%. Um, and I don't think that uh, my stocks are as susceptible to that kind of downside. Uh, one other thing I would mention here is I have a company called Flow Traders, which I haven't done a video on, but they, um, they are a market maker, and typically they move uh, opposite to the market. 
um, they make money via volatility. So as volatility goes up, they, they make more money on their spreads. Um, and, but they are a growing business generally. So even in a, you know, boring mark, boring up market, they're still growing their business and they're still, um, they still have the potential for upside in, the, in that scenario as well. But it's just not, they just don't make the money like they make when the market crashes. So that's a bit of a hedge for me. Um, so if I take my uh, cash component and add the potential flow traders, my idea here is if the market crashes, I'll cash in my flow traders and that's going to have give me at least 35% attack capital to deploy buying cheap stuff in the market. If And then if we get a situation where it's an absolute bloodbath, I do have a home equity line of credit that just sits there at a zero balance and that's designed for me to take advantage of deals of a lifetime if they ever come up. Um, they seem to come up once every 10 years. Uh, maybe we missed it, maybe I missed it with in 2020, but um, that's there just in case we get really uh, good deals at some point. Um, so bottom line here is I'm not, I'm not waiting for a crash. I'm not um, banking on it. I can still, I still have pretty good upside here if, if things go well. Um, but I am cognizant that there are a lot of risks. This is a very dangerous market right now. And so I'm ready for, I think I'm ready for anything. Uh, I, if I find some no brainers in the meantime, I will definitely buy them regardless of what the, the market's doing. And I'm always looking for those opportunities. Um, so yeah, I think that, uh, that's it for now, but I guess I would leave you with a quote here. Um, one of the, one, well, one of the best, uh, solutions to this might be great businesses at a fair price. Because as Manish Pabrai says, uh, great businesses transcend markets. So if you believe you have great businesses and you're willing to ignore them, maybe ignore this whole video. <laughs> All right. I'll see you in the next video, guys. Thanks for watching. See you soon.